All right, so Genesis chapter 37. We'll get right into this. Of course, last week we saw the whole, um, all the Edomites and, and their uh, family tree, as it were, you know, the, 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 um, the sons of Esau and, and the cities that they grew into and stuff. And now in 27, it starts off, and Jacob dwelt in a land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. So now he's going to go in a little bit about Jacob. But here we, we get really in 37 introduced to Joseph as a, a main character. And Joseph is going to be the main character for the next several chapters in Genesis. He's going to be um, a, a very, very big uh, part of the Bible here in Genesis. And what I want you to keep in mind, and we're going to go into this in all these different chapters, Joseph is an amazing picture of Jesus Christ, which is to come. He's like a type character. Now, he's a real person, obviously, but there's a lot of things that happen in Joseph's life that line up with Jesus Christ as a foreshadowing of what's going to happen with Jesus Christ. And there's so many things that I probably won't even catch them all. But there's a lot of them, and I'm going to point them out as we go through these different chapters. So just keep that in mind, and if you'd like to get ahead a little bit, you know, before we can, and I always recommend this, um, even though I don't really mention it, it's a good habit to get into. Wednesday night is our Bible study. It's the one time where we're going to have a service when you know what we're going to be preaching about before we even get into it. So as a way of preparation, I would recommend, you know, early in the week or, or you know, the week before or whatever, kind of reading ahead and just reading what's this chapter going to be about and maybe study a little bit for yourself. And it will help you to understand and to retain more and to learn more if you go through this chapter maybe once or twice, you know, in the days leading up to Wednesday night as we go through the, the verse by verse and see the things that you pick up that maybe I don't preach on and the things that I preach on that you didn't pick up when you were reading it. And it'll be a lot more fresh in your mind and it'll help you just in your overall understanding of the chapters. I recommend that for all Wednesday night preaching that you... you get a little bit of a, of a head start and read the chapters beforehand so you know um, kind of what's going on as we get into this. But um, and So I'm bringing this up now about Joseph to just keep that in mind when you read these chapters and we go through them. I'm going to point out different things regarding him. But um, we see here right off the bat, look at verse number 2. The Bible said, These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. So here, Joseph, of course, he's a teenager. He's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a young man at 17 years old. He was feeding the flock with his brothers, with his brother. Excuse me. It says, And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. And I brought this up in previous chapters, how, you know, with the, with the polygamy situation and, and how that caused all kinds of strife between the wives. And, you know, um, Jacob didn't love all of his wives the same. And he obviously didn't love his children all the same either. We saw that in, in multiple instances. We saw that when he went to meet Esau and he separated his families up. We saw the ones that he gave preference to and the ones he's loved the most. And even in this chapter, it says that he loved Joseph more than all the other brethren. He had favorites, and the favorites were, were obvious, right? And as a result, I believe when we see that he's bringing an evil report of the two handmaids' children, Zilpah and um, Bilhah, their children were loved the least because they were just the handmaids, just like those, the, the handmaids were loved the least. You know, he loved Rachel. That was the wife he truly loved. He was married to Leah, but he had more you know, um, feelings or emotions for Leah than he did for these other handmaids. The handmaids, he didn't even want to have anything to do with except that his wives were, were fighting and, and got him to, to do this, to get married to them just to have children with them. It's not like we see anywhere that he loves these, these hand. No, he doesn't love the handmaids. They were there just because their wives wanted children by him. And it's evident now, you know, with any child, that's not loved properly. Any child that's in a dysfunctional family and is lacking that love from the father, they're starting to do bad things. And we see Joseph here. He's the good son. He's the good child. He's doing all these things that are right. And one of the reasons, I believe, is because Jacob loves him. He's spending time with him. He's teaching him. He's training him. And that's what a father's job needs to be doing in order to make sure your kids grow up right. But if you don't love your children, 
You're not going to be teaching right. You're not going to be investing the time that's necessary. And as a result, these children of the handmaid, they're out doing wicked things. And it says Joseph has to come and he brings their evil report. The wicked things that they're doing, he's going and telling, he's telling his dad about them. He's, he's telling Israel, like, look, you know, my brothers, aren't you, they're not doing what's right. Which just exasperates the problem that Joseph has with all of his brethren hating him. Let's keep reading here. Look at verse number three. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Now, you know, the Bible says this and it's true and this is exactly what happened, but I don't think that's right to, you know, be playing favorites. Just because Israel did it doesn't make it right. But we see here that it was obvious and this was a fact that Israel did love Joseph more than all of his other children, the same way that he loved Rachel more than he loved his other wives. I mean... It kind of makes sense that he loves, and Joseph, of course, was the child of Rachel, so he's, he is um, her, her son, and he's the son of the wife that he loved the most, so apparently he loves him the most for the same reasons, I would guess. And um, he says, now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. So not only did he, was he the favorite, but now it's like an outward showing. He makes him this fancy coat, right? This coat of many colors that, that, that he has given to Joseph because his father loves him so much. So he's kind of set apart from the rest of his brothers. And he's younger than him. And he's, you know, he's, he's dad's, uh, you know, the, the, the special boy, right? He's, he's the one that, that's the, getting all the, the nice treatment. And his brothers resent him for that. They hate him because of that. And, um, you know, there's, it's, just, it's just evidence of more problems that, that stem as a result of, of, you know, playing favorites and having the polygamy and having this, this dysfunctional type of a family. And then it says in uh, verse number four, and when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. So now they're, you know, they hate him. And it's not, you know, you got to feel bad for Joseph because it's not his fault, right? Joseph, here we see a young man, a teenager, he's trying to do what's right. His dad loves him, but he has no control over that. I mean, who doesn't want their father to love him, right? Joseph isn't doing anything wrong, but now... His brothers feel snubbed by dad because Joseph's getting all his attention and they see that they're envious of him and they start hating him and they can't even speak peaceably unto him. They can't speak well to him. They're always, they're always on him, right? And they're, they're probably always beating him up and doing things. You know, I grew up, I was the youngest of three, not the youngest of 12. And he wasn't the youngest. I know Benjamin was younger than him, but he had a lot of older brothers to, to, treat them however they wanted to treat them. If they hate them, they probably weren't treating them very good. So I could feel for them a little bit. I didn't have that many older siblings, but um, he must have been going through some hard times here uh, being hated just because his father loved him more and his dad loved him so much. He gives him his jacket and, um, and they hate him. So let's see here. Verse number five, it says, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. So everything that Joseph's doing and is a part of, it's like it's just building on their hatred of him. And really what it is, see, as I mentioned earlier, Joseph is kind of a type of Jesus. We see Joseph being the good son, being the obedient son, doing when his father calls him and tells him to do something. We'll see a little later. He says, here am I. You know, I'm right here, dad. I'll go do it. He says, you know, go check on your, on your brothers. And he goes and he does it. He doesn't argue. He doesn't do anything. He doesn't complain. He goes and does what his father says. And we saw earlier, he's, he's already reporting, you know, saying, Dad, look, you know, these guys aren't doing what's right. And he's calling out the wickedness of his brothers. And, and he evidently seems to be doing what is right. And uh, the better Joseph is, the more his brothers are hating him. And Joseph here is, you know, God is revealing a vision unto him. He has this dream and it's given to him of God. He has this dream of what's going to, it's a prophetic dream of what's going to happen in the future. And we can see here God speaking to him through this vision, which infuriates his brothers even more. They hate it that much more 
now he's having visions. You know, he's already special. He's already dad's special son. He already has his coat, and now he, even God is treating him as a special kid. You know, you see where this is starting to snowball, and they just hate him more and more and more with the more things that are, that are going his way. And we need to be careful not to get in this type of a mindset of hating someone because good things happen to them. You know, oftentimes people get this attitude of things aren't going right for me. Oh man, you know, I got demoted at work or I've got, you know, all these financial problems. You know, I got an accident and everything's going wrong. And then, you know, so-and-so over here, he's got everything going right. He's, you know, and they look at them and start, you start to disdain people and hate them just for the fact that things are going well for them. Just because they're not sharing in your misery. And in, and in the problems that you have. And that is a wicked heart to have. That is an extremely wicked heart to have. And it's not something we ought to do. We ought to just be thankful that, hey, well, praise God that God's blessing this person. If you're going through hard times and you're, and you're you know, people don't love you as much, you know, don't let that bitterness, and that's what it is, is bitterness, creep into your heart to where you, you don't want anyone doing good and you don't want anyone succeeding and anyone doing right. Hey, praise the Lord that God's going to bless somebody. Amen. You know, maybe one day he'll bless you, but praise the Lord for that person. There's no reason to hate them and look down on them and, and wish all kind of evil against them just because they're being blessed, just because it's not you. And that is just a covetous, wicked, envious type of a heart. And the Bible even says that they're envious. Let's keep reading here. Verse number six. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. So he's going to explain this dream that he's had from God. Verse 7, For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. So he's talking about you know gathering in sheaves in the field. And his sheaf, all of a sudden, it just grows up and it's real tall. And obviously it's a dream, so it doesn't like completely make perfect sense. And that these, these other sheaves, they all bow down. All of, all of the other, that's what me, making obeisance mean. It means like they're being obedient by worshiping and falling down and, you know, and, 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 and getting down on their hands and knees in front of, so these, you know, th his brethren's sheaves were doing that in front of his sheep. And it says in verse 8, and his brethren said to him, shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. So we're seeing continually this hatred coming from his, from his brethren. And um, the, the better that Joseph is and the better these blessings are, the more they just hate him more and more and more. And you know, this dream wasn't very difficult to interpret. You know, a lot of times you have weird dreams like, man, I wonder what that meant. But this is pretty, pretty straightforward. He's saying, well, there's these sheaves, which, you know, whatever, they're sheaves, but they all bowed down to his, symbolizing that, that he's going to rule over them, that, that they're all going to come and be sub submissive unto Joseph, which is really weird because you think, you know, Joseph is so young. He's not the firstborn. You know, he's not the one that would inherit the double portion and that, that carries on the family name the same way that the, the firstborn does. And they're saying, you know, what is this dream that you have? And they're kind of giving him a hard time about it. Now, turn if you would, keep your finger here, turn if you would to 1 John chapter number 3. Because I, I just want to get into a little bit of, of the similarities here with Joseph and Jesus. And Joseph being hated just, just more and more and more. And, and that verse where it says, they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. This is why they hated Joseph. They hated the fact that he was having these visions. They, they hated the fact that he was having these dreams that were going well for him and ill for everyone else. You know, if he was having a dream about himself, being, you know, getting into all kinds of problems, they probably wouldn't have any problem with his dreams. They'd probably be happy about his dreams, that, that bad things were going to happen to him. But the fact that he was having these dreams that's saying, hey, I'm going to be lifted up over you guys, they hated him for that and they hated him just for his words, for the words that he spake. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse number 12. The Bible reads, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. 
Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. So the first takeaway from this before we get into the deeds of Jesus um, is that this goes all the way back to Cain and Abel. This type of an attitude. And, and the Bible explains here that Cain, the reason why he slew Abel, the reason why he killed his own brother, is because his own deeds were not righteous. They were, they were wicked. But Abel's was righteous. So when, when you're standing next to somebody and they're doing really good and you're not doing good, it makes, it makes what you've done look that much worse compared to someone who's doing what's right. And people hate to have that light shined on them and their wickedness, especially when someone else is doing it right. You know, if everybody's just doing the same thing wrong, every single person, we've all have the same problem, the same sin, it's not going to be as big of a deal because it's like, oh yeah, well, Brother Sebastian does that and, you know, and, and, and everybody else does that. You're not thinking it's big of a deal. But when nobody else is, is committing that sin or they're doing that wrong, everyone else is righteous in these regards, you're the only one, it makes you look a lot worse. And we saw here, I mean, even God pointed out, he's like, look, you know, Cain, if, if you do well, if you just do what I said, you'll be accepted. Just like your brother did. Abel did. I mean, there's nothing special about Abel other than that he just listened to me and obeyed me. And it's that wicked heart of not being able to take correction, not being able to, to, to just deal with your own issues. And you start worrying about other people's stuff that, that gets you in this, in this frame of mind where you start hating them. And when you should you know, be directing that anger just towards yourself, you're the one that screwed up. He didn't make you screw up. Just because he did what's right, you can't say, oh yeah, you know, there's always that guy in class that screws up the curve. Right? You, know, like just, you got this really difficult test. You know, for me, it was like physics. You know? We got these, these weed out classes in engineering and it was always physics. Physics was like, man, you get like a 40% and you're getting an A. Literally. Like, like it, was, it was so ridiculous the way they had these classes set up. But um, it, was, it, was, it was extremely difficult. But then there's, you always would have that one guy that would you know, study way more, just be extremely brilliant and just know this stuff. And they'd get like an 85. And you got like a 35. And you're like, no! Like... Like, because they build it on a curve and like, oh, that guy can't get more than 100 something, you know, so it's like, well, you get an extra 15 points. And it's like, no! But, um, and, and everyone hates that person. But really, there's no reason to hate that person. You're the one that failed. You're the one that didn't succeed. You're the one that didn't study enough or whatever, you know, and if you don't understand enough, well, whatever, but don't hate the guy because he's blessed with intelligence or because he's worked really hard. There's no reason to hate that person. Look at yourself and deal with your own issues. You're the one that got the score that you did. And this is the type of attitude that these people have. And this is what the Bible is explaining in 1 John chapter 3, saying, look, Cain killed Abel because his own deeds were wicked, but his brothers were righteous. He didn't like the fact that, he did what was, that his brother did what was right and he did what was wrong. And it just, it just shows that it can be done and that he didn't do it. And the Bible says, marvel not if the world hate you. So it's not a big surprise to us because we're, as Christians, we're supposed to be a new creature. We're supposed to be doing what's right and holding ourselves up to a much higher standard, the, the, you know, a standard of perfection in the Bible. That's what we ought to be trying to hold ourselves to. So when you actually start to do that and get sins out of your life, well, compared to the world... They're going to look at you, you know, a lot of people, oh, you're holier than now, oh, you're all this other stuff. And they hate you for the fact that, well, no, I, you know, I don't go out to the bar. I don't, I don't get drunk. No, actually, I don't look at pornography. No, actually, I don't, you know, tell dirty jokes. Actually, I don't partake in that. Because I'm holding myself to a godly standard. And when they're guilty of those sins, they'll start hating you for it. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily make sense, but the Bible says, you know, don't let it surprise you because that's exactly what's going to happen. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 3. The book of John chapter 3. We're in 1 John. Flip back to the Gospel of John chapter number 3. Verse number 20 says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. They hate the light. And if you're a child of the light and you're walking in the light and your light is shining, 
Those that do evil, they're going to hate that. They're going to hate that light in you. Verse 20, for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Excuse me, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. He hates the light. He doesn't want it shining on him so that he can be told that what he's doing is wrong. Because no one likes to be told that they're wrong. But when you're doing the evil, they're going to hate, you know, they hate the light. And that's why, another reason why you're going to be hated of all men for Jesus' sake, if you're doing what's right. Flip over to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. John 7, verse number 7. Jesus Christ said, The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. And remember, we saw Joseph's brethren hated him because of his dreams and because of the words which he spake. And what were some of the words they spake? He, gave, he, he told his father of the evil report of his brethren, the evil that they were doing, the wickedness of, you know, if his brothers represented the world, he was proclaiming the wickedness of his brothers and they hated him for it. Just like Jesus said that he testifieth of the works, that the works thereof are evil. Talking about the world. And that's why the world hated Jesus. Flip over to John chapter 15. John 15, verse number 24. The Bible reads, If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin, but now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. And Jesus is explaining here. He says, look, if I didn't come and perform all of these miracles and heal the sick, and raise the dead and turn water into wine and walk on water. If I didn't come and do all this stuff and abound in these great miracles, then I could understand them not accepting me as the Savior. Right? Exactly. I could see that. They had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my Father. He's saying, but they don't have an excuse. They saw what was done. They saw it with their own eyes and they still hated me. And basically because they hate him, they hate the father. He said, they hate me and my father. And because they hated him after seeing their works, they hated me without a cause. So when you hate somebody just because things are going well for them or just because they're living righteously, you're hating them without a cause. And that's not right. It's, it's wickedness. It's a, it's a hatred that is not justified. Flip back, if you would, to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verse number 22. Luke 6, verse 22 reads, Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. So Jesus is saying, you know, first he says, marvel not, you know, if the world hates you. Look at these examples. Look at Cain and Abel. Look at what Jesus did. He did all these works, yet people still hate him. If you do what's right, you know, the Bible says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. People are going to hate you. You know, if they call the, the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more, the children of his household, how much more are they going to they make fun of you and call you names and do evil unto you? They killed our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is perfect. And we're not perfect. But he says this, you know what? When that, com when that hatred comes against you, when the persecution comes, he says, you're blessed. He says, actually, be happy about that. Rejoice over it. Don't let it get you down. Don't let them defeat you with their words. Don't let it get to your head and make you get out of the fight and get out of the battle because they're coming at you and they're attacking you and people hate you and you want to stop being hated. You just want to feel loved by somebody. Hey, you can feel loved. Feel loved by your Father in heaven. Don't worry about the love of, these, of, the, of the world.
He says, blessed are ye when men shall hate you. That's a good thing. That's a great thing. When men hate you and when they separate you from their company, they won't have anything to do with you. Yeah, don't, don't talk to that guy. You know, as, as the Christian walks up to the water cooler and everyone else disperses because they know that you're a Christian, because they know what you believe. Don't let that get you. Don't let that get, grieve you or make you sad. When your family members don't invite you to a party, when you're uninvited places because of what you believe, because they know you're a Christian, because they know that you believe the Word of God and, and that you actually are trying your best to do it. It says, And shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. If it's for Jesus' sake, because, because of the way that you live, it's, it's because of Jesus that they're reproaching you. Hey, you be happy about that. He says, rejoice and leave. I mean, he's talking about jumping up. He's like, yeah, this is awesome. Leap for joy. That's a lot of excitement and, and it's something to be extremely happy about. Why? Because you're doing what's right. He says, if, if, if this is happening to you, you're on the right path. And this is also how you can spot these false prophets. These wicked false prophets that everybody loves. The whole world loves them. These Joel Osteens, the smooth talkers, the, you know, the, the people that, that no one will say a bad thing about. They're not having their name cast out as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Their name may be cast out as evil amongst Bible believers. It's not for Jesus' sake that their name is cast out as evil. It's because they're a false prophet. But he says, if this happens to you, you're doing what's right. When people cast out your name as evil and they reproach you and they separate you and they hate you because of Jesus' sake, rejoice. He says, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. You are earning yourself rewards by doing what's right and not allowing these people to, to, to back you down. It says, for in, li in the like manner did their fathers unto the false prophets. The false prophets said, or, I mean, excuse me, not the false prophets. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the, pro the real prophets, the men of God, the real men of God, the prophets that stood up and preached about Jesus and preached about Jehovah and preached about, you know, the Lord. They were hated. I mean, look at Jeremiah. He was let down in a dungeon. He was in this mire and they, you know, barely even kept him alive with bread and water. And, and you know, all the prophets that went through these horrible things and were hated and they were put in the stocks and people ridiculed them and laughed at them. That's how they were treated. But man, were well, they doing what's right and their reward in heaven is great. Praise the Lord for that. Let's go back to Genesis 37. I just wanted to point that out here that we see as Joseph is being hated for literally doing nothing wrong, for telling the vision that he's receiving from God, for doing what's right, for, for speaking against the evil that his brethren are doing, for listening to his father and just being loved of his father, for being blessed by his father. The same way some people are blessed by God and they're just hated by the world just because God's blessed them. Don't hate that man. That's wickedness. Let's um, keep reading here. I think we're in verse number nine. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? So even, even his dad saying like, What are you talking about? You know, like, like I'm not going to be bowing down to you. You know, I think that's where he didn't have a problem with, with his brethren, you know, doing obeisance unto him. But now like even dad... He's like, I don't think so, son. Like, you, got, you got something wrong. But, um, but no, I mean, God gave him these two visions. And we've seen in Daniel where, you know, God is, is saying, you know, it happened, you know, the dreams, when they happen multiple times, he's like, this is sure. The reason why you got this dream twice, Nebuchadnezzar, is because this is what's going to happen. And it's basically set in stone that God's going to do this. And um, we see that that is absolutely the truth. These dreams that Joseph has, of course, he, you know, he goes into bondage and everything else, but then God lifts him up. The world attacks him. The world throws him into prison. The world sells him off into slavery. But God frees him. 
God sets him free, and not only does he set him free, he sets him up at like the pinnacle of power and prestige and everything else. God blesses him. And that's the, you know, the overall story of Joseph. But um, these dreams end up coming to pass. This is, this is definitely a vision from God. Verse number 11, and his brethren envied him. But his father observed the saying. So Israel thought that he was wrong. That's why he rebuked him from the vision. But his, bre his brethren, they were, je they were, you know, the way that we use the term jealous, they envied him. They were envious of him and, and wished that they were in his spot, that he had things so good. And, you know, if this is really going to happen, why can't I have these visions? Why can't that be me? They were envious of him. But, you know, Jacob wasn't envious of him. He just, he just took it. He, he, he remembered it. He's saying, yeah, I don't think that's right. But he held, holds on to it, probably saying, well, we'll see what's going to happen with this. You know, see if he's got, if he really is getting a vision from God. And he's not, he's not envious of his own son. Um, this remind, this envy that they have. Turn, if you would, to Daniel chapter 6. Keep your finger in Genesis 37. We're going to come back to it. But this kind of reminds me of the story in, uh, in Daniel. Actually, you know what? Don't turn it. I'm just going to go over it real quickly. You, you can if you want. But in Daniel 6, basically what happens is that Darius the king... Uh, you know, Daniel's in Babylon during the reign of multiple kings and Darius comes to power and he sets over the kingdom 120 princes, so these, these princes to rule over the various regions of his realm. 120 princes, which would be over the whole kingdom and over these three presidents. So there's 120 people doing kind of local governance and ruling and then he's got this group of three people these presidents over all of the princes of the regions. And of course, the King Darius is at the top. So there's King Darius, three presidents, and then 120 other people to rule the, the general population. And it says, And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. So this is a way for the, for the king to kind of separate himself from making wrong decisions and all the people hating him and stuff. There's this separation, and he kind of protects his own, his own name and his own image and, and, and his own popularity and everything else because he's got these other people doing the work for him. And if he wants them to do something wicked, hey, it's you know, coming from this guy, not from the king. But... He had Daniel set up as like the chief of the three presidents. So basically, Daniel is just below the king. He's attained this position. Now, the king is the king. You know, it's this hereditary rule or whatever. Like, like the people aren't going to be able to attain. They know they're not going to get that position of the king. But this position that Daniel has, that's kind of, in their eyes, you know, it's up for grabs. And the people were envying Daniel because he's holding this position. And because he did so much. I mean, the reason why Daniel was even given this position is because of, of his faith. Because he was so true and faithful and a hard worker and, and had a lot of wisdom and knowledge, he, had, he got this position. Look at verse number 3, um, if, you, if you're there. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. He was an upright man. So they're trying to find a man, wait, I can't wait till this guy screws up because I'm going to bring this right to the king and he's going to bring him down and he's not going to be the ruler over us anymore. He's not going to have this position. And that's all they were out. They were out to get him. But he was an upright man. He feared God and he, he was doing what was right. So he, they couldn't find anything wrong. He, he didn't have these shady dealings going on. He didn't have these backroom deals going on with these other politicians. He wasn't corrupted. He was doing everything right. So they had no reason to, to, to be able to bring anything against him. So here's what they said in verse 5. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. He was a man of integrity, and they knew that. And they said, well, the only way that we're going to get anything against him is if we can make it so that, you know, when he's obeying God, then that's illegal, that that's against what, uh, what he's supposed to be doing. We need to find something that, that he's going to have to, because they knew his, his, his obedience was directly under God. 
and that he, he was the type of man that doesn't care what man is going to tell him to do. They knew this. They knew he had that faith that no matter what man tells him to do, if it's against what God says to do, he's going to obey God. And that's the strategy that they use. So they, they, get, they, you know, they have the king sign into law the, that if anyone prays unto their God without going to the king first, you know that they're going to be thrown into the den of lions. And of course, the decree gets, gets passed and it's written and signed into law. And Daniel, as, as is true, is, is keeping true to God, says, no, I don't need permission from any man to go unto God. I'm going to go to God just like I have been. Nothing's going to change just because you sign a piece of paper and say this is illegal and threaten and say, you're going to kill me if I do this. Well, I'm not changing the way that I serve God because this is right and I need to keep my prayer open to God. And I'm not getting permission to do this. And, of course, they use that against him. And God protects him. God blesses him for standing up and doing what's right. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 37. But the way, the way that his brothers envied him and kind of his position with his father reminded me of this story in Daniel chapter 6. It's that same type of, of covetousness that these other rulers had. And you got to think about it. Like, they're rulers, these other princes and these other presidents even. I mean, they're, they're, in, they're in charge of a lot of stuff. I mean, it's not like they're a peasant. They're, in, they're, they're ruling. They're reigning with the king, but they just didn't like that Daniel was even higher up than them. And these people that have this covetous type of an attitude, it just shows you that nothing is ever enough to satisfy. Their greed, their covetousness never gets satisfied. It's an empty pit. It's a hole. The more they get, the more they want, and nothing will be enough. And they're, they're bent on destroying people. That's why the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. It's that covetous, greedy attitude and heart that makes people go after others and, and do evil things unto them. I mean, they, were, they plotted here for Daniel to be put to death. That was their goal. And why did this even happen to him? Because of their love of money, ultimately because of their covetousness, because of their envy. That's why. And we see the same exact thing with Joseph's brethren. Because what do they do when they see him coming? They said, here he comes, let's kill him. They saw him afar off. And we're not quite there yet in the story. But they see him coming afar off and they plot and they plan. They're like, here comes that Joseph. Here he comes, let's get him. Let's kill him. But I'm, get, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. Actually, let's just jump down to there. Because basically what happens is his, his dad said, no, let's just keep, let's, let's go back to Genesis 37. We're going to keep reading. There's a couple points I want to make. I'm getting just slightly ahead of myself. So verse 12 says, And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And again, I mean, remember everything that happened in Shechem. Now they're back over there again. And they're feeding, you know, I mean, they're just feeding the father's flock, but, you know, with his brethren, it seems like nothing good is happening here um, in Shechem. Verse 13, And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. So he said, you know, right there, it's that attitude, that willingness, saying, Well, here I am, Dad. I'll go do it. I'm right here. I'll do exactly what you asked me to do. Verse 14, And he said to him, Go, I pray thee. See whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. So he sends him out, and he says, okay, you know, go, go check on them for me, make sure everything's well, make sure everything's good, and they're not getting into trouble, and then bring me word, just tell me what's going on. Verse 15, And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. So already they're not where they're supposed to be. They tell their dad they're going to feed the flocks in Shechem. He goes to Shechem. He's wandering around. He's looking all over for them. And this guy, you know, he comes across this guy and he's like, you know, have you seen my brothers? Like, I don't know where they're at. And he says in verse 17, And the man said, They are departed hence, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. So they just, they just go off and do something else. You know, they're supposed to be feeding their father's flocks in Shechem, and they just go off to Dotham, and Joseph finds them. It says in verse 18, And when they saw him afar off, they're probably going out to do some kind of wickedness, right? And now they're getting busted. 
And they see him afar off, and they're like, oh, great. Here comes daddy's boy, right? Here comes Joseph. He's going to go rat us out to dad. And, you know, they all hated him anyway, so they see him coming. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. Their envy and their hatred built up so much against their brother that they actually conspired to kill him. Why? Because their own deeds were, were wicked and their brothers was righteous. Just like Cain and Abel. They look at him and they despise him and they're ready to kill him. And verse 19, And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. So that really stuck a chord, struck a chord with him when he tells them their dream. You know, they didn't just blow it off as nonsense. As just saying, yeah, yeah, whatever, Joseph. And they're like, it really angered them. As the Bible said, they hated him for it, even for telling them the dream. It just, it just drove into them that, that, that Joseph might be, you know, ruling over them and that they're going to be bowing down to him. It just burned them up to even think about that. So they're saying, oh, here comes that dreamer, right? Here he comes. Verse 20, Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit, and we will say some evil beast that devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. That statement where they say, and we'll see, we'll actually see what happens from his dreams. This is an attack that Satan has always done against God's word. See, God is the one that gave Joseph the vision. God is the one that sent him. He, Joseph is the righteous one. He's the one that's literally speaking God's word. And he's the one that's doing what's right and saying this is what's going to happen. He got a vision from God. And they're trying to defeat what God has given in a vision. Think about when Jesus Christ was born. What happened with, with King Herod? And he said, when the wise men came and they were looking for Jesus in Bethlehem, and he inquired, like, it, Herod inquired of the wise men. He, he asked them, saying, so, you know, where, where is the, you know, where is Messiah going to be born so I can do honor unto him too? You know, trying to trick him because he just wanted to have him killed. And they ended up not, you know, God warned them. And they didn't go back and really tell them all the details. So what he ended up doing was killing all the children under two years old in the whole area. Just in that whole region, he killed them all under two years old. But of course, Jesus had escaped with Joseph and Mary into Egypt. But um, that was, and really that's Satan's attack trying to kill Jesus Christ. Because if you think about it, look, if Jesus was dead as, as an infant, then all of the prophecies, all of God's word, all of those visions, everything that was given beforehand would come to nothing. Which is the same motivation they're having here. They're saying, yeah, we'll see if he's going to be the ruler. If we kill him right now, yeah, right. Good, yeah, nice dream, Joseph. But they can't. Because you can't fight about, against God. Because when God says something that is going to happen, you can, you, there is nothing more sure than that is going to happen. Nothing. And the, the devil doesn't get this. Herod didn't get this. His brothers don't get this. That when something comes from God, when God has, has his prophets speak in the name of the Lord and they give a vision or they get, you know, they give the word of God, God's word never returns void. It never just doesn't happen. Amen. You think about even when, uh, when Jesus was tempted in the desert, right? What did the devil do? He's trying to make him to sin. Because then he can't be the lamb of the world, the lamb from the foundation of the world sent to, to take away the sins of the world. If he is imperfect, if he has an imperfection, if he sins against God, then he can't be the savior of the world. He's trying to screw up God's plan. He's trying to negate the prophecies that were given by God, but you can't. You can't. You can't fight against God. God's word never fails. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 21. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. So here we see Reuben, you know, if you remember Reuben committed sin earlier when he had taken one of the handmaids and, and laid with her, which was, really, which was really wicked of him to do. 
And obviously his other brothers were doing some wickedness. But Reuben, though, don't forget, Reuben was the firstborn. And he was born of Leah. The other brethren were seemed to be even more wicked. The ones of Bilhah and Milcah, the, the handmaids. They seem to be, to be the worst kids, right? And they're probably the ones that are provoking, let's kill him. But Reuben's like, wait, you know, we can't kill him. He at least has enough, you know, in him to say, you know, he's our brother. We cannot do this to our brother. He, st he still probably has a lot against Joseph himself, but at least he's not hardened and extremely wicked like these other guys are to want to kill him. So he's trying to save him here. He says, you know, let, uh, we're not going to kill him, guys. Let's not do this. Which is good because he's also the firstborn and he should be kind of leading his brothers as well. And he should have a lot of influence over them. Verse 22, And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. So Reuben kind of comes up with this plan, saying, you know what, we're not going to kill him. Let's just, let's just, you know, let's teach him a lesson. Let's throw him into this pit. And the whole time, Reuben's thinking, you know what? Yeah, they'll have their fun. They'll, they'll get their kicks. They'll toss him into this pit. We'll scare him real bad. But then I'll come later on and I'll get him out and I'll bring him back home again and, and everything will be just fine. This is Reuben's plan. And it says um, in verse 23, And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. Now, you might find that interesting that it says that, like, why does the Bible say, okay, so here's the plan. He's like, okay, we're just going to throw him in the pit. We're going to leave him there or whatever, and then Reuben's going to go get him out later. They take him. First, they strip the coat off of him, right? They're trying, probably trying to shame him. That's his glory, right? That's, that's just this, this showing his father's blessing on him and, and the fact that, that he was loved of his father. They remove that, art, that, that coat and just take it from him. They rip it from him and they throw him into the pit. And what I found really interesting is that the Bible makes very clear to say there was no water in it. Now, why would the Bible just mention that fact? I mean, it's dry. Why would you automatically think that there would be water in a pit? Right? I mean, threw him into a pit. There's no water in it. It's because of the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ was stripped of his clothing, when he was going to be crucified on the cross, they shamed him. Right? They, they stripped off his clothes, they whipped him, they beat him up, and then they put that, that, that purple robe on him and mocked him as a king and put the crown of thorns on his head before stripping that off him again and leading him to the cross. And, um, of course, Jesus Christ died on the cross. His body died, but the Bible says that his soul descended into hell. When the, the, the reference here to this pit and often through, throughout the Bible, you're going to see that hell is referred to as the pit, as the bottomless pit. You read through, especially in the Old Testament, you're going to see that hell is referred to as that place. And here we see Joseph being cast into a pit. And guess what? There's no water in it. Now, I was explaining this to a man today out soul winning that, um, that Jesus Christ's soul went to hell because he had a little bit of influence from Jehovah's Witnesses. And I was showing that to him. And I want to prove that real briefly this evening, turn if you would to Matthew chapter 12, because for some reason, a lot of people have a problem with this doctrine these days, that Jesus Christ's soul literally burned in hell and suffered in hell. They'll tell you that, no, he went to Abraham's bosom, and there's this, there's this nice place that's in the center of the earth. You know, it's right next door to hell, but everything's great. Hey, it's paradise in the center of the earth where the core is just magma and extremely hot and, you know, hell. But they say that, that there, is, there is one compartment that was good and that Jesus actually went to the good compartment. He didn't literally go to hell. Well, let's just compare that to Scripture because I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. They take one passage in Luke 17 about the, the rich man and Lazarus and Lazarus going to Abraham's bosom and they turn that into a whole place instead of a body part. And just because they could miraculously see each other, the rich man was able to see 
Lazarus, they think that everybody in hell was just able to see people. No, this is a miraculous event that takes place. It says there's a great gulf fixed. You can't see and talk to someone when there's a great gulf separating you. That obviously had to be a miracle. It had to have been. When you are, when, when you know, Bible says it's a huge gulf. You can't talk to people and have a conversation and say, hey, send him the tip, the, you know, his, his, his finger in water and put it on my tongue and have a conversation like that over the, the, the wailing and gnashing of teeth in hell. You think that they could just have a normal conversation as if, oh yeah, physically, here's paradise and here's hell and they're right next to each other so you can just talk to each other back and forth. It's ridiculous. It was a miraculous event in order for this story to be in the Bible about the rich man and Lazarus that, that was even allowed the conversation to take place. So what's the difference? Why, why would it have to be in the heart of the earth instead of the great gulf being between heaven and hell? I'd say that's a pretty great gulf. Yet somehow this man was able to see him. They were able to see each other and have a conversation. It's no less ridiculous to think that that happened as opposed to them having a conversation all within the center of the earth. But I'm going to show you that it's just contriving some strange doctrine out of thin air for no good reason. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 12. Because here we're going to see in Matthew 12, verse 39, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Now, he's, now here he's referencing Jonah, which is important because when... when the Old Testament is referenced. When you want to learn more about something that is, that's being referenced in the New Testament, go back and read the reference. But here in verse 40, it says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now the heart of the earth is the center. So the people say, oh, well, paradise is the center of the earth. This verse doesn't bother them so much. But the reason why it doesn't bother them so much is they say, oh, yeah, well, he was in the heart of the earth. Let's go back at Jonah and look at verse, uh, chapter number 2. Because in Jonah chapter 2, that's when Jonah is inside the whale's belly. Remember, Jonah is a prophet. And what do the prophets do? They are prophesying Jesus Christ and things that were going to happen. Jonah chapter 2, look at verse number 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. So Jonah's in the whale's belly. He prays unto God, look at verse 2, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Is Jonah in hell right now? No, he's in the whale's belly. So why is he saying, out of the belly of hell cried I? Because he's a prophet, because he's prophesying Jesus Christ being in hell. Jesus referenced this as a sign that was going to happen the same way that Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. So shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. And look, we're going to keep reading because verse 3, For thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas. And the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Now we're going back to Jonah. He was in the, he was in the sea. All this stuff was happening to him. Verse 4. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. Verse 5. The waters compassed me about even to the soul. So he's saying, okay, this is still Jonah. He's in the waters, right? They compassed me about. But now he's saying, even to the soul, the depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. Talking about seaweed. Right? Still Jonah. But look at verse number six. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption. O Lord my God. Again, we see the, the prophecy of having the earth with her bars about me forever. I mean, the earth is surrounding you. That's not being under the water. That's the earth being around you. That's in hell. Because the hell is in the center and there's earth all around. Makes sense. That's where Jesus Christ was. 
that Jonah was prophesying Jesus Christ, and Jesus even referenced Jonah in regards to his death for three days and three nights where he was located. But there's more. Turn, if you would, to Exodus chapter 12. You're in Jonah. Flip backwards to Exodus. If you want evidence, you want some proof about this doctrine. Oh, Jesus couldn't burn in hell? No way! Well, let's just, let's just see how, how, what the Scripture says. Is, is it really a difficult thing to believe? Exodus chapter 12. We know that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. He is the Passover Lamb. That is irrefutable. I'm not even going to go through the time to prove that from Scripture. Do it yourself. It's evident. Exodus 12 tells us about how they prepare the Passover lamb and what they're supposed to do. Look at verse number 5 of Exodus 12. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Was Jesus without blemish? Yeah, he was sinless. He was perfect. A male of the first year. Was Jesus Christ a male? Yeah, of course he was. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And when you, I'm not going to take the time to do this either. I've done it in previous sermons. What, at the time of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection lines up with these days of the week. It was the Passover when Jesus was crucified. The whole assembly of the congregation, when Jesus was on trial, said, Crucify him! Crucify him! They sentenced him to death. Pilate was willing to let him go, but the whole congregation of Israel, by and large, you know, the, the, in general, the, the nation of Israel sentenced Jesus Christ to death. It's, li it's lining up perfectly so far, and shall kill it in the evening. Jesus Christ died in the evening. Verse 7, And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses where they shall eat it. When you do that, you're making the sign of the cross where Jesus was crucified and His blood was shed on that cross. Let's keep reading. Verse number 8. And they shall eat the flesh in that night. Look at what it says here. Roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. And it goes further to explain the roasting and fire part. Eat not of it raw. Don't eat it raw. Nor sodden at all with water. Don't boil it. Don't put it in water but roast with fire. He's being very specific to say, you must grill this. This needs to be roast with fire. There's no other way to prepare this meat. Don't eat it raw. Don't boil it. Roast it with fire. His head, with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. Everything. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. So you mean to tell me that up until this point, we're going to start reading verse 5, we're seeing every single place that Jesus Christ lines up as the Passover Lamb of God, all of a sudden, oh, yeah, it just stops right there. And this whole being extremely careful to reference, don't, don't use any water, not sodden at all with water, not raw, roast with fire. You mean that it has nothing to do with Jesus Christ going to hell? All of that, if all this doesn't convince you, turn to Acts chapter 2. It's the last place we're going to turn on this subject. We're almost done with the sermon for tonight, but turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 2. Because this, this is what I usually just show people, because this should be sufficient enough. When I'm out soul winning and someone's like, wow, I never heard of that before, and, and they don't believe it, I like, I like to show it to them anyways, even if they've just said they never heard it before, because I try to back up everything that I say to a person out soul winning with Scripture so I can, I can just show them. I don't want them just to take my word for it. But um, look at verse number 22 of Acts chapter 2. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Subject matter is very simple. That's why I'm starting in 22 to get the context. He's talking about Jesus Christ. He's saying, look, you took him and you crucified him. Verse 24, whom God hath raised up. 
He's been resurrected. God brought him back to life. Having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Now look at what he says here after he talks about his resurrection. Verse 25. For David speaketh concerning him. Now he's going to quote the psalm. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. So he quotes the psalm. After he just gets done talking about the resurrection of Christ, he quotes this song, and now he's going he's to explain it. In verse number 29, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. He's saying, we know David. We know he's, he's been dead for a long time. His, his tomb is here. Right? It's here to this day. He's long dead and gone. Verse 30, Therefore, being a prophet... And knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. What part of that psalm was speaking of the resurrection of Christ that he just quoted? That his soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. In order for his soul to be left in hell, it had to go to hell. You wouldn't say, you know, don't leave my soul in hell, even though it's never been there, it's never going there, it never will be there. No. He said, because I will not leave my soul in hell, because Christ's soul was in hell. Now show me one point in the Bible that talks about hell being a good place. Hell being a positive reference. It's not there, my friends. Don't tell me that paradise is hell and hell is paradise. You're mad if you think that's true. Not one positive reference to hell in the Bible. Not one. And this is no exception. Jesus Christ's soul was not left in hell. And even just using those words, not left in hell. If hell was such a great place, why would you worry about it being left there? If it truly is paradise, why would you be worried that, hey God, don't leave me here? It's paradise. It's great. Why would you want to leave? Because it's not paradise. It's hell. It lines up with the Passover lamb. It lines up with Jonah, who was a prophet, seeing these things before, spake about the, or about the, the death of Jesus Christ, about his soul being in hell. The same way that Acts chapter 2 explains the psalm that refers about Jesus' about the Holy One suffering in hell. <clears throat> but we, you know, I got all on this whole rant because of the, uh, that phrase. Let's go back to Genesis 37. We're going to wrap things up. Because, you know, this isn't, the, Genesis 37 isn't the definitive proof that, oh yeah, Jesus went to hell. But it's interesting, isn't it, to note that it says that Joseph was thrown into this pit and it just clearly says there was no water in this pit. There is no water in hell. This is what it's foreshadowing. This is what it's referring to. And th this is just scraping the surface of, of how Joseph is seen as a type of Christ. When we get into some of these later chapters, it's going to blow you away. I, the first time I had heard this stuff and seen this stuff, I was, I was just like, praise the Lord for His magnificence and how wonderful His words are and, and how completely perfect everything fits together. I mean, we're talking about words that were written down in the time of Moses and events that happened way before that. The perfection that here and matches up so perfectly for thousands of years later to be fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ is astounding. There is no coincidence. There is no explanation other than this is the Word of God. Amen. 
And, and like I said, I, lo I love these. I, I, was, I was so excited to do Genesis, mainly because of all of these latter chapters. These are some of my favorite chapters, these stories regarding Joseph and everything, because it, it, it blows me away to see the perfection in God's Word. Let's, let's finish up this chapter here. Verse 25, And they sat down to eat bread. So they, they're not worried about it. They're like, okay, we're going we're gonna to eat some lunch. And they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, so now Judah pipes in. Remember, um, Reuben was going to just say, okay, let's throw him in this pit for a while, then he was going to go later on and just and get him out of the pit. Judah sees these guys coming. He says, what profit is it if we slay our brother? Again, the love of money is the root of all evil. He's worried about them making somebody say, look, we're not going to gain anything by killing them, really. What profit is it? And conceal his blood. Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. So now he's like, let's just make a buck at this. They hate him. They're willing to kill him. But like, well, why don't we make some money at it at least? And let not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother and our flesh. He's saying, well, you know, I, I, I guess we really shouldn't kill him. But I mean, pff, let's make money off him and sell him into slavery. And his brethren were content. So they, they went along with it. They're like, okay. Verse thir uh, 28. Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. And Reuben returned. So Reuben was gone during this time. It doesn't say that before that he was gone. But now we see it's like he came back. And it says, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit. And he ran, so now he's upset. He's like, well, where's Joseph? He's thinking probably first to himself, like, did they kill him? You know, because his plan the whole time was to let him out. Reuben didn't want to do, you know, he was saying, okay, we'll throw him in the pit, whatever, they'll have their kicks and, we'll, and I'll, I'll help him out. He returns and he's like, uh, where's Joseph? You know, because now his plan just completely fell apart. And it says uh, in verse 30, and he returned unto his brother and said, the child is not, and I, whither shall I go? Because now he has to go answer to his dad. He's the firstborn. He's kind of in charge of this stuff. He's saying, now what am I going to do? You know, he's, he's dead. You know, he is not. He said he's dead. And they took Joseph's coat. And I'm sure they told him, you know, what happened. But they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. So now they're trying to cover it up. Because they, they have to make an explanation. Why isn't Joseph here? Oh, no. He's not coming back. Well, uh, yeah, dad, we sold him as a slave. They're not going to go back and tell him that. So they, they concoct this plan. They kill a goat. They, take his, they kill a goat and they take his coat that his dad gave him, the one that he probably always had on that he never would leave without after they took it from this. So they dip it in the blood to make it look like an animal killed him, to make it look like he had been killed somewhere along the way. And an animal, of course, just, you know, took his body and ate it or whatever. And they're like, well, here, they bring it back to his dad and say, well, we found this. We'll keep reading here, verse 32. And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. So they're saying, is, is, is this Joseph's coat? And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. Jacob's believing him, thinking that all they found was the coat. So they're saying, well, he must have just been eaten then. And uh, verse 34, And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, for I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. We could see how, I mean, he really did love Joseph a lot. And he just could not be consoled and comforted over the fact that he thought that Joseph was dead. And he had to deal with this, this news. Thus his father wept for him. And then verse 36 says, And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. We'll get into that um, in a lot more detail. But I want you to turn to, to one more place. I'm going to close on this. I know it's been a little bit of a longer sermon, but I, I want to make this point. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 1. Because what we see in this, in, this, in this story, overall we see the envy, the hatred over the, the one man who is doing right and, and, and living righteously. And then this other group, I mean, it really turned into like this mob mentality too. Now they hated him, but they weren't all necessarily on board with killing him. We know Reuben wasn't. It seems like Judah wasn't either, but he, he still hated him enough to want to sell him. But the other children, they were both the Leah's children. The other children of the handmaid, they probably, they did want him dead. We know that some of his brethren wanted him dead. 
But this is this is one of those days. Well, I was reading, I was thinking about this too. Every once in a while, you know, rarely there's a, there's occasions in your life that happen that are extremely memorable. Sometimes really good things happen and it's, a, it's an extraordinary set of circumstances and it stays with you for the rest of your life. Maybe you do something good. Maybe you do something that's courageous. Maybe you help, you know, like, like you save someone that's drowning or you do something, you know, you do some, it's event, it's, the day starts off normal, just like any other day. Never would guess that something extraordinary is going to happen. But this is one of those days then that, that lasts with you forever. Sometimes it's good. You do something right. You make a choice. You come to a crossroads and you've got a choice and sometimes it's bad. And I think everybody's probably had that depending on how old you are in this room. These types of days where you think about, you know, you, you hit that point of decision making. What am I going to do? And I know what's happened to me, especially growing up. You're in a group of friends and all of you, one of your friends gets a really bad idea to go out and do, you know, go do some vandalism, go hurt somebody, go do something wicked, go do something evil. Hey, let's go steal something. Hey, let's go, you know, whatever it is. And you have the choice to make. Am I going to listen to my friends and so I can be accepted of them so that they could think I'm cool too, that I can do whatever it is that they're doing because maybe I'm too afraid to speak up against them? Maybe I'm afraid of what they'll think. Maybe I'm afraid that I'll lose my friends. These are the things that happen in people's lives, especially with kids, especially with, when you're younger. This happens even more often. So listen up, girls, because you need to be able to be strong in God's word and do the right thing, even if everybody around you is doing wrong. This is an event where his brothers were looking at this and they wanted to kill him and they sold him into slavery. That is, is a moment. This impacted everybody's lives forever. I mean, you think of the lie that they had to tell to his father and the grief in the morning over thinking that his son, his favorite son, was dead. That alone, causing that immense grief on a father to have lost his 17-year-old son is extremely wicked. Selling Joseph into slavery who knows what will happen to him? Who knows the abuse that might happen at the hands of whoever he's sold to and treated as a slave? And all for what? For a little bit of money. For 20 pieces of silver. You may find yourself in a group one day and someone wants to go do something wicked. Don't go along with it. Don't just be passive. So I'm not going to say anything. You need to stand up and say, no, we're not going to do this. No, you can't. I am not going to be a part of this at all. If you don't, even if you're just passive, you're gonna look, that, that day will be a memorable day for you forever. And you're going to look back and be ashamed and disgusted with yourself if you have any soul at all over the, the wickedness that you participated in. These days come up and they, and they hit you without you even realizing it. You need to be on your feet. You're in Proverbs chapter 1. Look at verse number 10. This is the wisdom that was given to a son. Godly wisdom. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Enticing means they, they want to lure you into doing something and, and tell you, hey, if we do this, you know, we're, we're going to get something real good or you're going to get, you're going to get this, this reward. And he's saying if they're sinners, if they're doing bad things, if they entice you, he says, consent not. Don't do it. Don't listen to them. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. So he's saying, if you, if you end up around a group of people that want to hurt somebody or kill somebody and steal from somebody and say, yeah, we're all going to get together. And don't worry, no one will catch us. We're going to take this guy's money. Maybe we have to kill him, but that's okay because you know how much money we're going to have and we'll bring it home and we can buy whatever we want 
and we could have all kinds of things that we could be happy with because we'll just steal it from this guy. Verse 15, My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird, and they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. He's saying, don't go that way. It's going to come back on you. When you do wrong and you do evil and you do wickedness on other people, that's going to come back and bite you way worse than you ever thought. And that's wickedness. And we need to be able to stand up. And this is what happened in this story. You know, out of, out of his brethren, if they were all there or not, I'm not sure. It's not that clear if all 11 of his brethren were there or at least 10, you know, assuming that Benjamin wasn't with them because he would have been even much younger than Joseph. But um, his other 10 brethren were out there. One of them. I mean, Reuben tried to do it, but he could have done a better job and made sure and, and stuck with it instead of leaving and then coming back that this wasn't going to happen. We need to be, to have that type of an attitude and, and not be afraid of what other people are going to think about us, but stand up for what's right. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the story in the Bible, dear God, and um, we pray that you would please help us to learn from it Help us to be strong and solid in the faith and to do that which is right. And um, God, we pray that you would, you would please just give us the boldness that we need in order to stand up and not to be afraid of what people might think or do, especially when you're outnumbered and you're the only one that, that might think a certain way. You know, we need to remember that maybe we're not the only one. Maybe other people feel the same way that we do. And all it takes is for one person to step forward and say no. And before you realize it, a whole bunch of other people that also wanted to say no, but were just waiting for someone else to do it, will come forward. But even if not, dear God, I pray that you please help us to be able to walk in our own integrity of heart and just to do what's right because we know it's right according to your word and not to do what's evil and to follow a multitude of people to do wickedness to your Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.